We're delighted to be here this morning. Um, thank you very much for the invite. Um, what we're going to do today uh, is talk about quite a bit. Um, we want you to learn more about Parkinson's um, and to feel confident about supporting people living with the condition. Um, a bit about finding out who we are, Parkinson's UK, what we do. Um, learning about Parkinson's disease and how it can affect a person's life. Um, learn about our project, Parkinson's Power. Um, find out more about the benefits of being active to people with Parkinson's. Um, hear about some of the benefits of swimming to people with Parkinson's and a, a chance for you to ask any questions you might have. We have got um, a couple of videos to play as well, uh, so fingers crossed they will work. Um, so if you are using a laptop, you will need your um, sound enabled to hear those. Yeah, so just a little bit about Parkinson's UK, the charity and what we do. So currently there's around about 145,000 people in the UK diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, the charity is 50 years old this year um, and we are the leading research funder in Europe. We've got a network of around about 450 local groups and around about 4,000 volunteers. Um, and the way that we support people are through these following elements. So practically, um, that's with lots of our information. A lot of that you can get online, um, but also that we make sure that this information is in um, clinics uh, with consultants, with Parkinson's nurses and with physios. We have uh, emotional support, so we use this through our local groups and cafes that are prominent now. Um, so this is uh, for people to go along, they happen monthly and allow people to kind of talk and share stories and, and kind of give each other pointers and help out. Um, medically, so we do do a lot of um, fundraising and promotion to try and have specific people, um, so specialists such as physios and Parkinson's nurses within each locality, so people with Parkinson's can access those specialists. Um, financially, there is a grant in-house that we have small grants that people can apply for. So for such things as um, there may be an increase in washing um, bedding, for instance, and, and things like that, and the washing machine may um, fail so they can apply to have that. Or they may need help with getting active, but they can't get the transport and things, and so they can apply for these little startups to help them with doing that. We've also got our campaigns that go on. Our major one at the moment is Get It On Time. Um, this is all around making sure that people with Parkinson's get their medication spot on. It is very vital that people with Parkinson's do have their medication on time. It can have quite a detrimental effect to the, the rest of the day and their symptoms. We usually find that when people with Parkinson's are in hospital, this may not happen, um, mainly because the NHS is stretched, the medication trolley might not go around as often as required and a lot of wards don't allow self-medication. Therefore we're using volunteers on these wards to raise that awareness of how vital it is and important so that hopefully they relax um, kind of the rules of that ward a little bit and maybe allow self-medication or just a little bit more aware that they will just have to get those pills on time. Um, another one that we're doing is for free prescriptions. So people with Parkinson's who have working age and do still work don't receive their prescriptions for free, um, which is quite different to a lot of other long-term conditions. Now, um, you will hear later on in the presentation that some people with Parkinson's can be up to 20 to 30 pills a day. So if you think about how many prescriptions that could be over a month, that could have quite a financial impact on a person who is still trying to work and who may have a young family um, and a household to run. Okay, so this is just a video. Um, it is from the Michael J. Fox Foundation and it's just to give you a little bit more insight to Parkinson's uh, disease and the, um, the way that we do diagnose and um, kind of the treatments that are out there and what we think may cause it. Age increases the risk of Parkinson's, and the average age of diagnosis is 60. So as our population continues to grow older, more people are likely to experience PD. In fact, people tend to think of Parkinson's as an older person's disease, but some get PD at 40 or even younger. 
Some diseases can be diagnosed with a lab test. Cholesterol levels and blood pressure are measured to evaluate for heart disease, for example. We need tests like that in Parkinson's, but they don't exist yet. Doctors diagnose Parkinson's by completing a medical history and a physical examination. They look for two of the three classic motor symptoms, which are resting tremor, stiffness, and slowness of movement. When people hear about Parkinson's, they mostly think of these motor symptoms, especially tremor. But some people also experience walking and balance problems, and PD affects other body systems. Constipation, sleep problems, cognitive changes, and depression can occur, sometimes even before a Parkinson's diagnosis. And some people report that they lose their sense of smell. One of the hardest things about Parkinson's is that everyone with the disease embarks on a unique journey. In fact, movement disorder specialists say, if you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's. Each person has their own mix of symptoms, and there is no standard trajectory or path. So if everyone gets their own version of Parkinson's, then what does everyone with PD have in common? To answer that, let's take a look inside the brain. In Parkinson's, the brain cells that make dopamine stop working or die. Dopamine is a signaling chemical or a neurotransmitter that coordinates movement as well as feelings of motivation and reward. When dopamine cells die, Parkinson's symptoms emerge. Exactly why these cells die is not well understood. Researchers believe that in most people, Parkinson's is likely caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. But although certain environmental factors, such as pesticides and head injury, are associated with an increased risk of PD, in most people there is no clear exposure we can point to as a straightforward cause of their Parkinson's. Similarly, while genetic mutations are linked to an increased risk of Parkinson's, based on what we know today, the vast majority of cases are not directly related to genetics. However, the field of genetics is moving fast. In Parkinson's, as in many other diseases, tremendous research is focused on genetics because this is our best opportunity. Okay, so yeah, just what I would like to kind of pick out and highlight from that video is the comment about the reward center. Um, and this is something to be mindful of when working with um, people with Parkinson's is that um, they don't get that stimulation, that, that instant feedback from gratification of achieving something straight away. Now, again, it's not everybody who will, um, who will have this issue, but some people may. So just be, just be ready for that. There's, Motivation is a slightly different, so motivation comes from more when they have that tangible kind of feedback that they feel better from um, symptoms being better, that they're able to do more. It's not like what we may get like if we do a, a personal best of a run or anything like that. We will not get that, that feedback um, or that feel-good factor. So it is something to be mindful of, um, that motivations are slightly different. So the next video, this is Janet's story, and it's just to have a look at her day and compare it to someone else. Now also what I'd like to um, highlight here is that Janet's very active uh, compared to the people we are currently engaging with. Um, so people are experiencing um, greater sedentary levels than what Janet is shown here. Pain is with me all the time. It, it, it never goes. I've just learned to live with it. My name is Janet Kerr. I'm 50. I'm married to Gary. We have four children and four grandchildren. I was first diagnosed with Parkinson's in June 2016. I have to get up. I don't sleep very long. I feel very stiff, I feel achy, I feel sore. I could go three days and have had nine hours sleep. It took me a whole year to do a forward lunge. Oh, I see things click and grind. My balance isn't great. And I have sort of pain down my neck and the, the, like the electrical current that runs across the shoulders. This is a no choice activity. Unless I want my day to be pretty immobile. Ow, it's sore. There's no on or off, it's just 
constant to 22, 22 a day. If I just get medicated properly, um, it will help with walking because that's the biggest impact on my life at the moment. I need to keep occupied and if you don't use it, you lose it. On the bike, it's still painful because that foot feels like it turns to concrete. I'll get caught out and I get a sharp pain. The pain could be the hip, it can be across the joints. People who don't know me don't realise the pain I'm in. I end up filling my day because every day you think, oh, that's something else that's been stolen from me, you know. I want to grow old just gracefully. <laughs> I want you to still be climbing mountains, abseiling, rock climbing, well into a ridiculous age. That was my plan, my life's plan. So the way I see it just now, that's not going to happen. Okay, so we are definitely not trying to depress everyone, but um, that was a, a really good illustration of how Parkinson's does affect people. And, and definitely from the first video, take away that, that quote, most definitely if you take away nothing else from today, that if you've met one person with Parkinson, you've met one person with, with Parkinson's. As we can see here, um, there are over 40 symptoms to Parkinson's. Um, so it's not just, as many people say, that shaking thing. Um, there's a whole load of physical symptoms here we've got. And again, people will have a combination um, of these symptoms. Um, part of the problem as well that we, we have is that often um, drugs that people are given for their Parkinson's will cause even more side effects. Um, things like dyskinesia. Um, with a consultant the other day who was saying someone was much more wiggly than usual, um, that was his, his phrase, and that was because of his medication. Um, so this can have a real impact on, on people's people's lives and you can have, you can really tell when, when you're talking to someone with Parkinson's and the medication is starting to wear off, there is a, such a change in their, in everything, in their, their behavior, their, their physical aspect, everything. So as well as physical symptoms, there are a lot of uh, mental and emotional symptoms, um, which you can see here, um, there is obviously a lot of anger people have. Parkinson's is indiscriminate. Um, it can affect and will affect absolutely anyone. So people do feel very angry about that. Um, apathy is a, is a real problem. Um, it seems to be described as like having permanent jet lag. So trying to get out and be active is very difficult when you feel like that. Depression, um, hallucinations are common. Um, delusions, compulsive behavior. We hear about people who um, all of a sudden start gambling heavily, drink, drinking heavily. Um, isolation, information, guilt. Um, Again, the, the strain Parkinson's is putting on people's carers and partners as well. Um, but as I said, there are all these symptoms that will happen in any combination at um, any time uh, for people. Um, there is also a condition of being on or off with Parkinson's. Um, and you meet some of the Parkinson's who is on and they're absolutely fine. And sometimes it's very difficult to know they have the condition. But that switch, that off switch can be... Um, flit very, very quickly and in front of your eyes, they will turn into someone who you, you don't recognize, who can barely move, really, really struggling. Um, so again, this is a very, very, very difficult and horrible condition. It is it's been described as, as being really brutal. Um, and as you can see, if you had all these symptoms or, or combinations of doing anything, leaving the house is a, is a big challenge. Um, doing anything anywhere, traveling, going anywhere can be very difficult. Um, as Anna's already mentioned, um, the lack of dopamine caused by Parkinson's does affect the reward center of the brain. Again, a big issue. Trying to get someone to be more active is very difficult when they get no uh, instant reward from it. So, Parkinson's Power, um, that's the project we're running, um, funded by Sport England uh, Active Aging Fund. Uh, so we know um, that exercising, um, vigorous exercise can have a real benefit on people living well with Parkinson's. It can really slow down the progression of the condition. But the condition in itself means that exercising vigorously is a really difficult thing for people to do. Um, 
So uh, going back a couple of years now, we worked at Sport England, and so we want to try and learn a bit more about how we help inactive people with Parkinson's become more active. What are the barriers they're facing? Um, so last year, we did a lot of insight gathering uh, in our pilot area of Northeast England, um, learning about really how can we help people more and help people, more people more often. We learned very quickly that inactive people do not respond to the word exercise. They really don't like it. It conjures up images of, of gyms, lycra, sweat, a chore, something that's not enjoyable. Um, really a big turn off for people. Um, but again, people with Parkinson's wanted their condition to be recognized and understood, um, as well as being supported by a real person. So essentially that means don't just send me to the, the nearest exercise class or nearest class or nearest activity, regardless of what it is. And don't just give me a leaflet or point me towards a website. I want someone, if I'm inactive, I want someone to come and knock on my door, encourage me, help me. I want to do something that I enjoy and it's suitable and relevant for me. Um, so if I've never done yoga in my life and got no interest in it, don't say go to a yoga class. I know what I, what I enjoy. So the focus now we have is on providing really any activity to people to help them get active. Um, anything that's enjoyable, that's achievable, that's fun, um, that overcomes those barriers and makes people want to do it. Um, the good thing with Parkinson's is the more active you become, the quite quickly you see the benefits on your mobility, your core strength, lessens tremors, improves your uh, mental as well as, as well as physical well-being. And so as soon as people start getting to that point, they are very open to doing more and more. So uh, we took all this back to Sport England and they uh, funded us for another couple of years. So we're nearly at the end of, of uh, second, uh, the first of those new two years, the so next year, the last year of this pilot work. Um, and we focused on two areas, um, engagement and support. Engagement for us is finding people with Parkinson's, which is actually quite difficult because you can be diagnosed, let's say 55, still working, still have relatively mild symptoms and you disappear off. You don't want to engage with us as a charity because quite often you, you come face to face with people with a much more advanced condition and you're looking into, a, into the future and people don't want to see what's going to happen to them. So they, they do disappear off the radar. So we need to find and engage with those people. Um, listen to them um, and find activities for them that are appropriate. So we've got a whole range of things that people are doing, whether it's um, walking, boxing, um, we've got someone who still wants to go off uh, deep sea fishing, um, off Hartley Pool, which could be quite interesting, um, bird watching, walking the dog, whatever it is. Um, tagged onto this um, is the support element, and, and that's what Anna concentrates on. We, we're piloting a lot of different um, volunteering elements of the project. Um, helping people directly with Parkinson's Power Buddies. So it is that person who will come and knock on the door and help you get started. And someone who will go with you for the first time. So if you are going swimming for the first time, someone where you can find where the change rooms are, where you get changed, how you get in and out of the pool, where you get parked, all these sort of things. We're also working with um, students from Newcastle uh, College and Northumbria University. We're working with our local groups um, to have a regional champion, a cheerleader, if you like. And we've got a great partnership going with uh, National Trust, and we're using their properties and their volunteers um, to support activities across the region, uh, working with National Garden Scheme to open up um, gardens, people with Parkinson's, to have a mixture of activity and um, mindfulness and wellbeing sessions there. Um, and other partners like, for example, Act of Northumberland, uh, who um, have, I want to say, about 14 sites across the region, I think, leisure centers, mixture of uh, pools, gyms, et cetera. Um, to again give more benefit to more people with Parkinson's. That's where we are with the project. Uh, I'm pleased to say we are expanding next year to take our work out of the Northeast to the rest of the country um, to start pulling together more templates about what we can do uh, with more people more often. Um, so we're showing our local groups how they do set up, for example, boxing classes or Tai Chi or Boccia or indoor curling or whatever, and uh, really changing the way we as a charity talk about physical activity and exercise. As I said, we are um, supported by Sport England. Um, <clears throat> hopefully most of you have seen the new campaign from Sport England and Richmond Group of Charities, uh, which we're involved with, called We Are Undefeatable. And again, this chimes very nicely with, with what we're doing on the project and what we're talking about today as well. Um, 
it's it's a focus on managing a long-term health condition um, and being active is about finding what works for you so this fits exactly with us it's doing anything to get and stay active ideally for us we want that long-term goal for people to be exercising or being active with an intensity that gives them real benefit um, but we realize for some people many people that's a long road so do what you can but try and do more so we'll quickly uh, show you this ad in case you haven't seen it before that's life that's what all the people say you're riding high in april shut down in may but i know i'm gonna change that tune well, I'm back on top, back on top in June. I said that's life, and as funny as it may seem, some people get their kicks stomping on a dream. But I ain't gonna let it, let it get me down. But this fight over, it keeps spinning around. Cause this final world, it keeps spinning around. Okay, so um, we've spent a lot of time there talking about physical activity, um, but as we know that people are inactive and they, they don't like the word exercise, but we need them to kind of aspire to exercise or to reach that intensity that's going to have that benefit on the condition. Um, so Parkinson's power is all about those people taking those initial steps to get active to then with the, the fact that we'll hopefully push and move them on to move from physical activity to taking part in exercise. And it's, it's all about getting that, that balance. Um, and it's important to discuss the difference between an active lifestyle and targeted exercise. Um, there is kind of the little research into the benefits of physical activity only. Um, a lot of the research is saying um, that it has to be exercise and reaching those intensity levels of two and a half hours a week um, of moderate to vigorous activity. Now, obviously, that's all very relative to the, to the person and to their fitness level. Um, so we are hoping to kind of have this scale um, that the targeted exercise is um, the more dominant feature in, in a person's life and that it's not just a once a week choice or of activity it must be done on a more regular basis <clears throat> so um what we're saying is that exercise is just as important as taking your medication um because of the benefits that this that it can have um so what we're looking to do is that physical activity and exercise it needs to be targeted um so symptoms specific so if there's balance issues you work on balance and so forth Frequently, um, so like we were saying, something should be done every day. Um, it's kind of along that lines of what Janet mentioned, you, you use it or lose it. Um, now, it's not saying that you're out running every single day. It's about doing something every day just to keep going. That sufficient intensity, again, just as I've mentioned, making sure that it's tailored to the needs of the person and that it's not just um, physically challenging, that it is mentally as well, so to have a cognitive stimulation within the, the activity or the exercise that the person's doing. And most of all, that it's enjoyable. I think we all know this as well, that for it to be a benefit to the participants, it needs to be meaningful and fun. So um, the Parkinson's exercise framework, this has been developed um, with Parkinson's UK and with Parkinson's specific physios. Um, and this is kind of the journey that um, they, they go on within the exercise framework. Now, yes, for all these arrows are pointing forward. Now, as we've heard with a person with Parkinson's that um, they can have on days and off days. So this is very fluid that one day or one week they could be kind of staying active but then the next week managing a complex challenge within the symptoms but then again another week back to being okay and able to do everything so you have to be very mindful of that um, also if you do want to look at the framework in more detail that's the web link at the bottom there to to have a look at 
Okay, so just looking at those elements in a little bit more detail. Um, so investing in exercise from diagnosis. So like I've just said, people do move in both directions. If the symptoms are mild in this stage, um, it's best that it's the optimum time to improve physical con um, condition. So really push people to try and be hitting these, these targets and these levels of activity um, to, to really have that benefit. And already at this point, seek referral to an informed professional. So um, somebody with an exercise referral background that may know about this or physio, um, physios that will have that. And exposure on an exercise focused lifestyle. So do say, yes, you might walk to the shops and things like that, but have you, have you tried a, a class or have you tried um, maybe taking that walk to a fast walk, fast paced walk and, and building people up? So the staying active. Um, so yes, it's all about that staying or increasing activity levels. Um, this is kind of your day-to-day -day, um, life for people. So increase exercise, talk and part on some specific issues. So whether that's posture um, or balance, things like that, that we need to work on. Now posture is a big um, issue that you hear people with Parkinson's talk about Parkinson's stoop or a Parkinson's walk. Um, so it's to target those those elements that they could improve and maintain an effort that pushes the person. Again, it's all around doing what is relative to their fitness level. So if that's that they're getting up and down out of their chair a few times a day um, or a few times within that hour and that's getting that intensity, then that's what it is for that person. For somebody else, it might be entirely different. Okay, and then managing the complex challenges. So this may be a case of um, that it is linear for some people. Um, and as the, the condition progresses, a lot more complex issues evolve. And what we have to be mindful of is that people with Parkinson's may not only be dealing with Parkinson's, there may be other long-term conditions, arthritis um, or mental health issues. So it's about being mindful of those things. But um, be sure at this point that it's specific so the physical functions that people are doing, you're focusing on everyday activities. So it might be that it's learn how to um, get up and down out of a chair again, um, walking um, and, and having those everyday, bending over to do things. So ex exercise classes, that are really going to target those, those elements and those functions that just allow people to have a good quality of life. And again, maintaining a general fitness, physical well-being. So as well as still having kind of supervised exercise classes or maybe from those exercise classes, giving them homework so they've got exercises at home, that they're doing that general kind of cardio. So we're going to uh, play a video next, <clears throat> which um, was very kindly um, done for us by um, a chap who his email address is, uh, ironically, well, he calls himself Steady Hand Steve, which is great. Um, so Steve is, um, is actually the chair of, I think, our Trent Bridge branch as well, um, of our local, one of our local groups. Um, very switched on guy, um, as you'll see from um, his video, but uh, Steve has been doing um, a fair bit of swimming, really sees the benefit from it. Um, so we're going to play this and you can uh, see uh, what Steve says. Steve Moss, I'm 46 years old, I live in West Richard, I'm near Nottingham. Um, my diagnosis with Parkinson's was in 2011, so it's been nine years ago, almost nine years ago. Uh, I was just a month shy of my 38th birthday, fairly active. I was out running with a friend and my arm, my right arm, kept dragging against my chest. Wall. Um, so I went to see my GP and she said to me, she asked me two questions. One, well, she asked me whether I was feeling tired. I said, yes, because I had, uh, but I put that down the fact I had very small children, four-year-old and six-year-old at the time. I had a very busy job. I was head of uh, engineering and science for a multi-site manufacturing company. So a fairly busy lifestyle, running 20, 20 kilometers a week. Um, so I was fairly active. And she asked me then the second question, did I have a private health care with my employer? So I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, she sent me off to see a neurologist the very next night. So Monday morning, I went to see the GP. Tuesday night, I went to see a neurologist. Uh, he basically manipulated my arm, watched me walk backwards and forwards across the room, and then uttered the infamous phrase, it's most likely, I think, in my opinion, you have some sort of early onset Parkinson's, which was a huge shock at the age of 38 years old. 
Um, anyway, so kept on with the active lifestyle. Uh, the prognosis initially was fairly good because, um, yeah, I, I was 38, I was fairly fit. The initial consultation said, yeah, hey, you should be okay, carry on. Um, and but it didn't quite pan out like that, but I decided to keep active. Uh, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro two years later um, for my 40th birthday. Um, and then in, and, and I was still running, I was still running, although by which point, because my right arm and my right leg were starting to give up the coast at this point, the running style was slightly unorthodox. Um, and I, um, but in September 2013, so again, two years, two and a half years after I was diagnosed, uh, I did the, the half marathon here, the Robin Hood half marathon here in Nottingham, to which I still claim I have the unofficial world record for the 40 to 45 year old male category with Parkinson's. Two hours, 14 minutes, and 50 seconds, <laughs> which is pretty good time. <laughs> whether, whether, whether you were 40, <laughs> a 40 year old without Parkinson's, you'd be pretty pleased with that sort of time. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we, we continued to, to sort of uh, carry on and as pragmatic as possible. But unfortunately, my symptoms got a lot worse. So by 2016, the, I was on 1,500 no, milligrams of um, acetaminophen, which is a fairly high dose, um, and I was taking Equip, the Pinerol as well, and my symptoms were getting worse. Dyskinesia was getting worse. Tremoring was getting worse. Uh, I couldn't think straight. I was still trying to work. I could say a very, very stressful job. I reported straight to the board of this large company. Um, but by the end, by the middle of 2016, things were getting really out of control. Um, and eventually, I ended up um, taking an ill health retirement. So I found myself retired at 43 years old. Um, financially, I was okay, so that was good. Uh, but not a lot to do. But I had been on the Parkinson's um, self-management program earlier in 2016. Met a few guys, and we set up this thing called the Trembridge Parkinson's Cafe. And that really is, is a bit, 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 bit of a sort of background to, to, to where I am and where I come from. The cafe has actually been a huge focus for me, both in terms of, of, of actually socialising and, and giving me something to do my time. But it's also been uh, a springboard into other sort of physical activity. Because it does keep me mobile. Um, you, you even so. How am I, uh, yeah, probably some of us are exercising between four and six days a week at the moment. So Mondays I exercise twice. I go swimming in the morning, and I go to a, a, a group in the evening over in Beeston near the University of Nottingham, which is uh, we do a, like a high intensity warrior style circuit. Um, Wednesday nights we do another warrior circuit. Thursdays occasionally I can get a bit time to time, but we go boxing. So you can go work out with a with a, uh, a guy who's the, whose mother has Parkinson's that we met, and he was a former he was a cage fighter, professional cage fighter for nine years. He runs this uh, cage fighting club, but uh, he also does a one hour a week Parkinson's training. So so you keep active, and I think it's um it's good for a number of reasons. One is even though it makes you feel tired, it keeps your strength up, if that makes sense. It's a bit of a counterintuitive thing for you. Because you can feel absolutely awful. I can feel terrible. I can feel like I don't want to go out because I'm just so exhausted. But I go to the exercise group, get moving with other people. And uh, and, then, and I think there's a social aspect as well as a physical aspect. The benefits are I come home and I feel, feel a bit more vigorated and refreshed. Um, so swimming was a new one for me because I hadn't really done any any swimming probably since I was a kid. Um, I hadn't done it really. I was more of a running person and, uh, um, than, than swimming. Uh, I could swim. I got all the badges from school and whatever, but I hadn't swum properly for years and years and years. And um, an opportunity came up earlier this year in Nottingham um, to and um, well, it was facilitated by the charity Parkinson's UK. Um, they, I think it was Katie Smith, our area development manager, managed to, to get a small amount of money to, to hire the pool for us. And, uh, and about a dozen of us with Parkinson, various stages. So we've got from age, I think I'm probably about the youngest at 46 now, up to 70 year olds with Parkinson. And we have an, an hour in the pool every Monday morning um, with two coaches. They sometimes come in the water, Increasingly, no, they, they don't need to do that. Um, and what, what the benefit for me, I think, is in the water, you get, a, you, you've got the resistance and, and it supports your buoyancy, obviously. Um, and we sometimes, we have a warm up in the water, so that's a bit of fun. So we've done things with the, uh, with the they've got these sort of like foam weights, and you can actually, you know, when you push a weight out, like, uh, they're foam, they, they weigh nothing, but you get them in the water. 
and the resistance you can probably sort of do exercises like that or cushing out like that under the water phenomenal in terms of working on your on your upper body strength um and then i mean this week they just we uh, they were throwing tennis balls so we were, we were catching tennis balls and throwing them back or treading water which of course is, is giving you sort of a multi dimensional workout because you, you're treading water so you've got your physical thing going on and you've got to think because they're shouting your name there's suddenly a tennis ball flying towards you so so we have a bit of fun um doing it as well and um yeah it's been been a very interesting experience i suppose it's um, allowed a number of people who probably wouldn't have the confidence to go into a swimming pool on their own um, because it, even if you go into a pool and they say the life and you tell the staff about your condition then actually would if, if you got into trouble when you were swimming would you actually be spotted by the by the staff i don't know um and potentially you feel a bit strange because when there's a guy like this week i've just come out of the swimming pool i, I was out this changing room he asked me how many lengths I'd swum. I said, well, I've only, uh, I said, I nearly managed half a length. And he looked at me as if this was some sort of alien because uh, I guess he assumed that I outwardly look like I'm fairly healthy because my tremor has gone, thanks to deep brain stimulation, certainly, largely. So I just look like somebody who had been in a swimming pool. But one of the problems that I've got at the moment is I've got a, um, the, my right-hand side, the, the, the downside of the deep brain stimulation surgery I had in 2017 is that it's left me with a bit of a gait problem, um, and quite often I can I can be walk I can struggle to walk long distances or short distances because my body just wants to spin around, and the same things happens in the swimming pool. So I've been having to work really really hard to try and sort of keep keep from spinning around. A bit like being a missile, so sort that of, you can imagine a corkscrew effect. So you start swimming, and, and then all of a sudden I'm on my back, <laughs> which which initially back in may i really freaked myself out big time because i went into the deeper water and i thought i was going to drown corkscrewing and then of course my arms and legs were flapping around and it really was quite scary but the beauty of these co the two coaches that work with us is they, they start thinking about how they might help me um so i tried various things i tried using a tow float which they use in the river when they go swimming in the river um proof of trend believe it or not but um, yeah, so the tow flow, that, that was quite that was quite reassuring because um, you sort of it, it bobbed along the water and if I needed it to stop, I could just hold on to it. Um, and then I also tried a, like a, a, a belt around the middle. Of, uh, it's a uh, it's got a foam on the back of it, so so it gives you extra buoyancy, and that was hugely hugely important. And uh, and and say over the course of I think with the, the ten or ten twelve of us have been swimming now. Since May this year, I mean, uh, you wouldn't believe it. These people that there was a guy, a friend of mine, good friend of mine, Ray. He comes along with me. He hadn't. He, he used to swim competitively as a teenager. He hadn't been in the water for 40 years. Certainly hadn't done any diving. So, um, and this week we've been diving in the water. We've been actually been diving. Somebody's been getting stuff off the bottom of the water. So it's, it, they, they've hugely improved our confidence in the water to the point where I think, um, yeah. I mean, well, I've certainly achieved. I've not quite got a full length yet, but I'm nearly there. Um, which is, which sounds a bit crazy, but like I say, the thing about Parkinson's is that it robs you of your physical confidence or your physical uh, ability to do stuff, and that kind of eats into your mental side because you then feel less and less confident um, to the point where I don't think I'd have gone into a swimming pool if there hadn't been some other people around me. Um, and sometimes I may mean, struggle to get in. You walk in down the steps at the shallow end. Sometimes my leg just won't go, won't move. So it takes me three or four minutes to actually get in the water. Once I'm in the water, relax a bit, and it's a really, it's a good fun session. Um, and yes, yeah, just I think there's bet you get the physical benefits and the well-being is not just from exercising; it's from exercising with other, other people. And the other good thing is with the swimming, which compared to some of the other like the warrior classes is um, several of the wives swim as well. Mm. So, um, um, in fact, Ray, Ray's wife, she, 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 I think she swam a kilometre an hour yesterday, mm -hmm. or Monday morning. Uh, I mean, these are seven children people, and, and, and it's incredible, really, but that's a benefit for, for not just the person who's got parts, but their, their extended um, caring uh, community. Yeah. So we've men, we think. But we've got a couple of the guys there whose wives come along. They both swim whilst... The, and they they just showing up down the, the far lane, whilst the, the, the others we we do various things. 
Um, and um, but the other thing is by the pool, by the hiring rate, the pool provide the lifeguard, which means the lifeguard is just looking at the 10, 12 us in the pool, and then two coaches are, are focusing on one or, one or two people at a time. But so you, you, you feel absolutely safe. Um, and then you're getting in and out of the pool and getting changed. Um, and there's a couple of there's a couple of people who's, who have a carer come with them to help them get changed. That's fine. And it just made that I mean that makes life a hell of a lot easier. But I mean the big downside, as you know, is the cost of it. Yeah, getting in and out of the pool or the pool air or to the pool is fairly good um, because we've got level access through the door. Um, blue uh, blue badge parking outside. Um, and one of the things that was was actually quite interesting early when we first started. To get these blue overshoes, these little plastic things, blue overshoes onto your overshoes, which is a real pain. Um, and uh, Nottingham City Council took a really positive step this year, and because they were single use plastic, they used to use them once and you threw them away, uh, they got rid of them, which was actually a positive step, I thought, because it meant that I only had, instead of fiddling with these things trying to get them off my shoes, you take your shoes off before you go into the changing room. So that's job done, which has uh, made, made my life a little bit easier. Right, so you saw the benefits there to, to Steve, it's very kind of him to talk about all that. <clears throat> you can also see that uh, to all intents and purposes, Steve's a, a normal guy, fit, used to run, walk, etc., etc. but his big challenge is, is getting to swim a whole length in a pool. So that's a, that's a really graphic illustration of the impact that, that Parkinson's can have. Um, there are a few barriers to people with Parkinson's swimming. Um, there is a cost of getting dressed and undressed. Um, it's going to be incredibly difficult. If you do imagine you've got uh, incredibly rigid, stiff muscles, or you've got a really pronounced tremor, getting dressed is a, it's a huge issue. We do have uh, quite often stories of people who have to go and attend an appointment or a clinic who have to set an alarm for pretty much four in the morning because um, it takes that long to get up and washed and dressed, etc. So. Um, you can imagine um, how difficult it can be in quite a cramped cubicle or changing room sometimes. Um, we have had people say um, they've got real benefit from swimming, but by the time they got, got changed and got, got home, they were absolutely wiped out again, so the, the benefit was, was undermined a little bit. Um, if you do have um, you know, very rigid muscles or a, a posture which is affected by Parkinson's, again, being in the water can be quite difficult for you, especially to keep your head above the water. Obviously, financial cost. Um, it's not everywhere that can support this sort of thing. If you're just going swimming, there is a, a cost and a cost to travel and get there as well. Big one is uh, fears of freezing. So freezing is a, is a quite a common thing with, with Parkinson's. And it's exactly that. You can completely freeze. Um, you, you're pretty much rooted to the spot. And sometimes all it takes is a little nudge from someone to get you, get you going again. Sometimes it's, it's a complete, um, you're as rigid as a, as a board. Um, so bad enough doing that at home or on dry land, but in the pool, obviously that's a huge cause of anxiety with people. That's going to happen, and you're going to sink straight to the bottom. No one's good to notice. Falls as well um, can be something which really affects people, um, and um, people can really struggle with any any um, any surface, especially if it's if it's wet or slippery. And access to the pool. Um, I was talking to um, Andrew, who's talking after us a while ago about um, all the good things that swimming gun are doing, and obviously there's this huge benefit that swimming gun is providing to, um, to auditing you know, new pools and that sort of thing. But there are still quite a few pools around, I think, where people with um, problems with mobility are hoisted pretty much into a pool, which is very, uh, I wouldn't want it personally. Um, you know, it's it really uh, undermines your dignity. Um, so we know there are more pools now with. with uh, pool pods, which is fantastic, but that's one of the things that people do struggle with. Even Steve saying there, when they're shallow inclines to get into the pool, he can really struggle. So there are quite a few things that people do think about swimming. Yes, I'd like to do it, but I am very anxious about it. Yeah, um, but going on to the benefits again, we heard Steve talk about how much he enjoys um, the sessions and that he does have some benefit from it. Um, and after speaking to a physio um, with a specialism in Parkinson's, she kind of came up with what the benefits are, and we have heard this reiterated by people with Parkinson's. So being able to do postural exercises well supported by the water. Um, it can increase the range of movement using the buoyancy. Um, so swimming is known for being able to relax the muscles and increase flexibility, so it allows people 
whilst being supported to, to be able to do movements that they may not be able to do unless they were there. Um, so they do have that general freedom of movement, uh, which is hugely benefit, beneficial to them, um, especially if they're putting a lot of effort into it, if it, it's just making it that little bit easier for them to do that. Do balance in a safe way. Um, so balance work, so kind of stand on one foot, um, things like that. If they were doing that in a class or something, they may fall and, and obviously fall under a hard surface. With this fall into the water with a buoyancy age, it, it's, it's going to create less um, injury. And of course, as we talk about all the benefits of, of swimming anyway, that's what um, people will get from that. So that the fitness, the endurance, especially the spiritual health, um, if they're working on breathing exercises within the water and the relaxation um, that comes from that, that, that feeling afterwards of the, the muscles, having that workout, but feeling rather loose. Um, and as you've heard there, Steve sounds like he has tremendous fun. Um, so that's what the, the benefits are from that. Um, so here are just a few um, articles that are out there about the research. If you are wanting to look into it a little bit more, it is more around about um, kind of the aquaerobics and those kind of sessions. And But it's to give you that little bit more information around that. Um, now, just when we're talking about the exercise in general, um, it's kind of in the infancy in humans about the neuro neuroprotective effects that um, aerobic exercise and things like that can have. A lot of um, research that we have is based on animal research, um, but it, it has been shown. Um, so we are now pushing for this research and to kind of see what benefits are and take it further. Okay, so just a little bit of um, reflection um, for, for you and or if there's any questions, but just think about how can you be more Parkinson's aware and how can you make your centre more Parkinson's friendly? Now we're saying Parkinson's, but I'm sure going through this, you, you'll be able to kind of re relate this to other neurological conditions. Um, so it's not just about Parkinson's friendly, but yeah, um, just how can you do that? And if you just please put your comments in the chat box and anything that comes through, we can answer today or we can get back to you at, an, at another time if you have any questions around any of this. Um, yes, yeah, so I've just seen the research articles on the Parkinson's UK website. There are some research articles there. Um, if you would like them, though, um, sent to you, you, can't, you can get in touch with me and we can get the articles sent to you um, about any of the exercise or the, the swimming that you've seen. Yes, the um, videos will be available. The presentation will be made available after this um, webinar. Uh, specific medications, <clears throat> um, not specific to the drug. I just think it's, <laughs> as, as we keep saying, that um, people will react differently to different medications at different times. So um, again, it goes back to that. If you've met one person with Parkinson's, Uh, so, um, being aware that um, the person you regularly see with Parkinson's may be absolutely fine, five days in a row, five sessions in a row, but the sixth one uh, could be having an adverse reaction to medication. And what extra swimming aids would be useful? Um, from talking to people that do go swimming, um, we find, especially if they're just going swimming by themselves, that they find kind of the buoyancy vests very useful. 
and it's a very very much a security measure as well. And um, but as we heard Steve mention, um, the the traditional floorboards or having a tool, if those are available, we know not every um, kind of swimming pool will have these. Uh, so now there's those kind of things. I think again because Parkinson's is so very specific, it's um, that whatever aids they need is going to be specific to those. They use the noodles. Yeah, um, noodles can be used um, useful as well. And I think that a, a big thing is that not so much a swimming aid, but, but people with Parkinson's being confident that that wherever they're going, so if they are going swimming, that the people there understand a bit more about their condition, um, which could re anxiety is a, is a big part of having Parkinson's. Um, so if you can take as much of that away as possible, that's that's a good thing. So they understand um, that people where they're going know what's going on, understand them, understand the condition. Um, noise, yes, that's a really good question, Nessa, thank you. Um, again, um, some people with Parkinson's not at all bothered. Other people with Parkinson's have a real problem with noise and echo, um, which again, is a bit difficult for swimming. Um, we've got one group, in fact, we're there tomorrow in berwick upon tweed who have an exercise or class in an indoor um, bowling, Bowling green, is that what you call it indoors? Yes, must be, which is fantastic because it's got that felt floor which deadens all the sound. Um, but we do find that some people um, struggle with speech, struggle with hearing, but um, the day to day surroundings around them are amplified. So, again, if someone with Parkinson's is coming to a class, it's worth just having a quick chat very casually. Is there anything we need to know um, about uh, your condition? The noise will be one of them. Okay, lovely. I think that's done with any questions. Um, I think there's, um, we've just put at the bottom there, join us at Team Parkinson's. Um, we have, um, it's, if you'd like, um, have a look at our website. There's lots of information there for people with Parkinson's and carers and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, physical activity providers. Have a look at the Team Parkinson's as well. It's our membership movement, if you like. It doesn't cost anything, but it just, um, it helps us build a community of people who understand more about Parkinson's. So um, it's a real mixture of people. There's, there's, there's staff, people with Parkinson's, there's carers, there's physios, there's GPs, there's just people on the street who join Team Parkinson's. But uh, I would urge you to have a look and join up um, if you would like. And when you do, please um, wear your badge with pride. And I think that is us. Thank you very much, everyone. Yep. If you have anything, that's our email address there that you can get us on. Um, and anything that's questions of today or from the pro about the project or anything like that, please get in touch. All right. Thank, thanks, everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right now? Hiya, Tim. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, Andrew. Andrew. Yep. There you got me. <laughs> Great. Um, no, that was that was excellent. Thanks. That, thanks very much for that. And uh, and just to finish off. Um, before we before we close, we can. If there are any further questions, we can answer a few more at the end as well. Um, is I do recognise some of the names in the room, but some of them, some of you, I don't. Um, so for those of you that were, the, the health team um, either have or haven't had contact with, um, we we'll just want to introduce the Water Wellbeing Program to you and what Swim England are doing at the moment. And um, to support people with with long term health conditions to get into into the water and benefit from whether it be swimming specifically, whether it be aquatic activity in general. So there are lots of opportunities, and I think really good um, um, presentation there from um, from everyone at Parkinson's UK there just to outline some of the some of the benefits of swimming as well, and uh, as well as as physical activity in general. And um, so yeah, if you pop on at the next slide. Um, Tim or Anna, would you be able to yeah, pop, pop to the next slide? Yeah. I'm trying there, Andrew. It's not letting me now. One moment. There you go. There we go. Okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll be fine. So really just a, a very brief background in terms of where we've come, the journey we've come as, uh, in terms of Swim England. Going back um, a, a couple of years now um, in terms of the work that DCMS did uh, around sort of cross-government strategy, around physical activity and sport, 
um, and Sport England strategy. So going back a few years now, um, those those new strategies prompted Swim England to think about things in the context of of, of health and how what we were doing around around health and improving health of the nation and in the context of swimming. And we formed a health uh, swimming and health commission. Um, who one of the first pieces of work that they um, did was um, was publish this particular report, the, uh, the health and well-being benefits of swimming. And it was a really important report because it was a, a very much an evidence review in terms of all of the available evidence around the benefits of, of aquatics and swimming um, on people's health. Um, really wide ranging, a number of literature reviews and systematic reviews to come up with some of the answers in terms of yes, the resounding yes, that there are some really good, really strong and tangible benefits that can be had from being in the water. Um, and in some cases that can't be had on land. And so that report was um, really strong in terms of the evidence base, but what we were maybe lacking in was a knowledge in terms of what works. Um, and what actually works when in terms of getting people to 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 get in the water to stay in the water and to, and to actually succeed and and experience the the outcomes and um, that were highlighted in that report that were possible to be had and um, so that report was produced and one of the things that came from that report was that sport england have commissioned us and um, to do some work around this um, and so we've developed what we call the water Wellbeing program and um, to support operators to be able to um I guess it, it create health improving pool spaces to and, and support and, and offers that will help people with long term conditions to benefit from aquatics. So if we can just try the next slide. And it the the model itself has been formed on the basis of our, our three frontier model. And for those of you involved in swimming, um, um you may be familiar with this. For those who aren't, the, the frontier model is based on on a, a wide range and uh, collection of insight that we've gathered over the years in terms of what really gets people swimming what works and what doesn't and so forth and and it's quite clear from from the three the three frontier model um, that there are some really important stages that we need to think about in a person's journey to be able to get them to succeed um, and the first being visibility and relevance being able to make people aware of the the benefits of swimming in the first place some people don't understand those benefits and, and don't realize them but when they are presented to them then then something something clicks and and people then realize that maybe swimming might be an option for them and might be more beneficial for them than, than other forms of exercise and and decide to make that journey through to to a local facility but then if they come to a facility um, and the environment isn't right. Frontier 2 tells us that we need to make sure that that environment is prepared in advance for those people coming through. And there may be a number of barriers, a myriad of barriers in place for people who want to access leisure centers but can't. Um, access being a key issue and sometimes, and we've talked about and uh, Tim touched on on the pool pod uh, work that we've been doing in terms of installing pool pods, giving people an option and an alternative to the hoist systems that have been in place in the past. Some people still like to use hoists, but a lot of people don't. Um, and so access is an issue. In terms of the environment, though, as well, it's not just the physical environment, but the staff who are there ready and, and willing and, and, and understanding the individuals who are coming through. So I think today's webinar is one of the, one of the examples of how we've tried to um, try to reach that, broach that issue um, in terms of raising awareness of specific health conditions like Parkinson's um, through our webinar program. There are many other forms of education that we've developed through the Water Wellbeing Program as well. And in terms of Frontier 3, if we can get people to realize that swimming and aquatics is beneficial for them, if we can get them over, on, over all the hurdles and barriers as they walk through the facility, if we can get them into the pool, what do we need to do with them when we get in there and, and what, are the, what are the kind of things that would work for people? Um, so that's the three frontier model in, in, in short version. But uh, essentially what we've done with that is then create the water wellbeing model. So if you pop onto the next slide, um, again, thanks. Great. And that's essentially what the water wellbeing model looks like. So taking that three frontier approach, um, we haven't just des designed or de you know, developed a, an activity to put in a pool. Um, we've thought about all of the, the processes and the systems um, that get people there in the first place and how we support them. 
um, and all of the wraparound support that needs to be there um, in terms of staff training. So we've developed um, an aquatic activity for health qualification um, for those who are maybe working with people with long-term conditions on a regular basis in exercise referral schemes but don't have an understanding of how to take people into the water and how to work with people in the water. Um, from a swim teacher perspective, we've worked um, in terms of the development swim teacher guidance around how to, to modify swim teaching for different conditions and um, lots and lots of um, solutions hopefully that have been put into this model to, to make it work um, and we're working as I've said with operators to try and identify what operators need um, in terms of the elements of that model um, and be able to to pick those elements off the shelf to really make a, a better experience for people overall so other training in terms of customer experience training for for the whole facility team and um, we've also developed an environmental checklist on the back end of our dementia friendly swimming program which allows people to um, allows in, uh, facilities and um, to be able to assess and audit their facility in terms of whether it be um, suitable and, and friendly to to people who have maybe long-term health conditions or disability or impairments that might prevent them from actually accessing the facility and being able to then develop an action plan and um, to be able to deal with some of those issues and um, the colored boxes there and um, they're a little bit small on my screen but uh, the colored boxes are just some of the some of the things that we've you know the interventions in the pool the things that we've done the pool pod program to actually be able to remove that big barrier of being able to get in the pool in the first place and um, we know exercise referral schemes exist and we've tried to work and look at how exercise referral programs um, or, or pathways can be can be tweaked to to incorporate aquatic activity um, learn to swim programs exist adult learn to swim um, is, a, is a key offering and something that can be tailored to people with long-term health conditions as well um, and our good boost good boost system as well which is our artificial intelligence application and um, which is essentially um, being able to take people into the pool allow them to exercise supported through uh, tablet PCs on the pool side and um, to be able to have uh, specific and tailored exercise programs to support them. An ongoing support from the Swim England team, in addition to what this is, is, a, is, a, is essentially a national audit of aquatic activity programs. And um, so our insight team are gathering data from sites to be able to answer those questions that were raised for it with in the 2017 report to be able to say, okay, this is, this is really what works. This is what doesn't work. This is how we can make things better in the pool for individuals. And um, if we move on again to the next slide, thanks. Um, I was just explaining the good boost system there, which is just a, some visual representations there, um, which allows people who have barriers to land access. I think one of the key, key strengths, and um, you know, the, the presentation earlier as well picked up on some of those, but the key strengths to, to, to um, aquatic exercise is that there are many people who come through um, programs like our good boost you know, aquatic rehabilitation program who tell us that they can't physically walk um, unaided or without significant pain for more than 10 to 100 meters at a time. So 40% of people who come through the Good Boost program have told us that. And so they wouldn't succeed on land. They wouldn't be able to walk um, and they wouldn't be able to take part in, in cycling schemes and, and maybe even gym-based um, offerings as well. But they get in the pool and they're able to do things that they haven't been able to do for a long, long time. Um, next slide. And then we're nearly done. You'll be glad to hear. And we're working with a number of partners. Um, apologies that Parkinson's UK isn't on there. We're starting a journey here um, in terms of and need to have further discussions. And I know Tim mentioned that the work that they've done in the Northeast will now be rolling out further um, in 2020 and beyond. Um, so that's great news to hear. Um, and we've what we've tried to do is work with um, a number of the, the different Richmond Group charities and other charities that exist there in terms of working with MIND, working with Versus Arthritis, working with the Stroke Association to identify and develop those national partnerships, but also identify who the local partners are and the people that we need to work with at a local level to be able to identify individuals who 
have arthritis, identify people who have mental health issues and would benefit from getting into aquatics, and then being able to help those operators to to uh, create those relationships with those charities and get people in the pool. So there's an identification recruitment pathway um, in development there and something we'd want to discuss further as well, definitely with, with Parkinson's UK um, as, that, as their program expands and we want to start to identify more people who might benefit from aquatics. Um, I think nearly last slide. Um, just click on from that one as well. That's just a, a representation of the exercise referral pathway, um, and that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it for me. So what we're trying to do is is, is um, to to work with operators who who will um, who who see this as a as an opportunity for them and see aquatic activity um, as an opportunity to develop further um, and to be able to sit down with those operators and work through our water wellbeing model and what it can help you with and what it can provide you with as an operator. Um, and hopefully there is a solution there and, and a number of um, answers to, to some of the uh, the problems that might be faced by operators and being able to make this really work. Um, and that's what the model is really about. So please get in touch with us. Um,